And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. We're going to pick it up here in chapter 44 with verse 17 in a moment. You know, this is, a, this is one of the most fantastic chapters in the Word of God. That it lets us have a look at what transpires in the very millennium itself and how precious that is that uh, the millennium uh, lets us know what transpires. But come with me, though. All people, even those that didn't make it, are transformed into spiritual bodies. What? For discipline and to wait the day of judgment when God judges all. And for, by what? Well, how does he judge them? From the book of life. Your record, it's all right there. When you repent, that that is evil is washed away, and uh, that that is good always remains. Um, so having said that, we understood that most of the priests went astray when Israel did. They were called the Levitical priesthood. But then there is the priest of the Zadok, which is a Hebrew word that means the elect or the just. And we're going to pick it up speaking of them. They can approach the prince and the Messiah during the millennium. No one else can. And the remainder of this chapter will let you fill you in and let you know exactly what transpires. So chapter 44, verse 17, let's pick it up there and let's go with it. And it reads, And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them, whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. In other words, um, what, well, what clothing is this? Well, of course, it's, um, it's the very righteous acts um, the, and clothing that we wear even in the eternal kingdom. You can read of it in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. This is the close. Fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is, what, what is it? What's it made from? It is the righteousness of the saints. In other words, it's the righteous acts of the saints that forms the linen and gives them the position or place uh, as the Zadok in the heavenly kingdom. And this is the clothing that must be owned when you approach Messiah. That, that's what it's about. Verse 18, returning to the 44th chapter of Ezekiel, it reads, They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches and upon their loins, they shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. And there's not going to be any sweat there. Everything is cool. Everything is refreshing. And there's no tension whatsoever. Because that is the king, and you're in the kingdom. And as God's elect, you have that right to be right there with him in following orders to instruct all that would listen Verse 19, and when they go forth into the utter court, that's to say the outer court, even into the outer court to the people, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered and lay them in the holy chambers, that's the little chambers around the holy place, and they shall put on other garments and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. The, and so those righteous acts are not to be shared through this period of time. Well, you've got a lot of people out there that didn't make it. They're raised in spiritual bodies, but they still have a mortal soul, meaning liable to die if they don't participate in the second resurrection. So uh, how precious it is to come to this place and for God to share with us exactly how it's going down. Verse 20 Neither shall they sh uh, shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. In other words, they're going to be neat, well-trimmed, well-groomed, looking good. 21. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. That's a no-no. Verse 22. 
Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that had a priest before. Now, you have to come with me again. We're in spiritual bodies. You're not going to have weddings as you have weddings today. We're talking about the many-membered body of Christ, and the wedding is with Christ. Okay. And it just simply happens that the Zadok make up part of that many-membered body of Christ. And you have to think of that. They're right there with him. They're serving him. They're ministering to him and to the people as he ministers. Verse 23, And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane. Do you want to know what's taught in the millennium? Do you want to know what those priests are doing in the millennium? In, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, they teach between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's discipline. And that is taught in the millennium whereby hopefully they can latch on to that discipline, hang on to it, treasure it, and be pleasing to Almighty God and those people around them. Verse 24, And in controversy they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. Now, this is one of the only places where it speaks of, God, of anyone judging other than God and the Son. But here as the elect or that member, but notice they judge according to God's law, which is a form of discernment, which you even use today. It's a gift of God. But here, when you are teaching the difference between the holy and the profane and teaching with discipline, then certainly there will be a certain amount of judgment in that. Why? If they go wrong now, they're going into the fire the lake of fire. And if we can prevent that, I mean, it's our brothers, our sisters, and anything we can do to help and um, in that teaching, we're going to do it. It's your destiny, 25. And they shall come at no dead person. That means everybody's in spiritual bodies. What does it mean, dead person? Spiritually dead. They did not overcome in the first resurrection. You can come at no dead person to defile themselves, but, oh, here's an exception, but for father or for mother or for son or for daughter, for brother or for sister that have had no husband, they may defile themselves. In other words, when it comes to that fact that you can, if you have a loved one of that category, that fits in that category, you can go help them. You're going to pay a little bit of a price for it. But well, why would you want to, to help them out, to get their act together, to give them knowledge and wisdom that they evidently do not possess, and to try to get them to get their act together and to overcome? But at the same time, what does that particular verse do? That particular verse documents that inasmuch as God said, let us create man in our image, that everyone looks as they look. Therefore, naturally, how could you help a mother, father, brother, or sister if you didn't recognize them? Well, naturally, you do recognize them. Why? Because they're your kin. They're your family. Though we would all be at the same age in spiritual bodies, you would still recognize them. This is your documented proof of it. Many people have lost loved ones that have gone on before them. You're going to see them again. You're going to recognize them in the millennium. You're going to be with them. And this is your documented proof from the very Word of God. I don't care what language you translate it in. It still says the same thing. It still means the same thing. But again, as I stated, there is a penalty. Many will ask me, well, why does it say a sister that hath had no husband? Because when two marry, they become one flesh, and therefore um, she, it would fall to a different family. I'm sure God would still allow. Verse 26, 
And after he is cleansed, this is the penalty you pay. After he is cleansed from being with that dead person spiritually, they shall reckon unto him seven days. It's going to take seven days away from Messiah, seven days before you can put on those holy garments again of the righteous acts, seven days of purification after having touched the dead, spiritually dead. And that's a, that's a low price to pay, though, for helping someone you really love. It's time well spent. I mean, we're not going anywhere. We're in the millennium. And if you're truly one of God's elect, you're there to assist, to help, and, and to um, lend knowledge and wisdom and guidance to those that need it. That's, that's your com the compassion that God puts in the Zadok or God's elect. That's one of the ways you can always identify one of God's elect. They have compassion. Verse 27, And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary, into the inner court, to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God. And what is the sin offering, dear? Because he did touch the, those that were spiritually dead, is love. Love is the sacrificial offering given in the millennium. Given to who? To, to the Messiah. He that paid the price so that we can have salvation, so we can teach salvation, so we can present salvation to whomsoever will. Verse 28, And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. You understand this? Not as old Esau that didn't care about his inheritance. It shall be unto them for an inheritance, I am their inheritance. And ye shall give them no possession in Israel, I am their possession. That's really a hard one to latch on to. God himself is your inheritance. The creator of heaven and earth. The creator of all things. God owns all things. Therefore, inasmuch as you inherit him, then you inherit all that is his. And the reason they don't need to give you an allotment in Israel of land or anything else, because wherever you step, you own it all. And not that it will mean that to you, but that is the actual fact. And you will never use that to overlord on anyone or anything else. You don't. Maybe this lets it, lets it be better understood. When, he, when Jesus taught to the only two churches out of seven, he was happy with. So you want to make sure when you attend a church that part of their framework, their basic teaching, has to do with what Smyrna and Philadelphia taught. If they're not, you're in a heap of hurt. Well, what did Smyrna teach? He, and, and you can read it in... Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first, the last, which was dead and is alive, that's to say the Lord Jesus Christ. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. You're, you're poor in a sense, but thou art rich. Well, how are they rich? Because they possess the living God. He is their inheritance. Well, what is it they're doing? And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are of your brother Judah and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. In other words, the Kenites that claim to be our brother Judah, and they're lying about it. Does your church teach that? If they don't, you're in a heap of hurt because you're going to have trouble identifying the false Messiah. Fear none of those things which, shall, which thou shalt suffer, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. In other words, delivered up so the Holy Spirit can speak through you to the world. And you shall have tribulation ten days and ten days only. That's no step for a stepper. You can cut it. Be thou faithful unto death. I will give thee the crown of life. In other words, you inherit the living God. You are rich. Regardless of what your condition is on earth. Because God, Yahweh, the creator of all, is your inheritance. It, friend, it doesn't get any better than that. If you want to try to get a taste for it, some, some night when it's clear and you look up at the, at the 
the mass universe of stars and the heavens, the planets and the earth, the sun and the moon. Naturally, you're not going to see the sun at night unless you're in certain places. But understand, it belongs to your Father. He created it, and what He has created is yours also. It's an awesome, awesome thought. Talk about a very humbling thought. That humbles you right to, the, right to your knees, to know and to love the Father that thinks enough of you because you have eyes to see and ears to hear, to know and to follow him, that you are worthy of such an inheritance. How fantastic it is. Maybe you can, at the same time, better understand why God hated Esau, who hated that inheritance. But then that's the way some are, and Esau happened to be of that type. Then returning to Ezekiel 44, next verse, 29, please. They shall eat the meat offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. Every devoted thing in Israel that is given concerning our Father is theirs. And they do inherit it. It is theirs. You know, again, this takes us into the millennium. It began back in the 40th chapter. And it's letting you know of what they do in heaven, so to speak. Only we're still in the millennium age, the day of the Lord. It's a little bit of different as it will be in the eternal kingdom, which comes into uh, track on in uh, Revelation chapter 21. But here, come with me to this point so that you better uh, <clears throat> understand <clears throat> the events transpiring. Verse 30. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblation shall be the priest. You shall also give unto the priest the fast of your, first of your dough, that he may cause the, the blessing to rest in thine house. And, and so it is. It doesn't get any better than that, my friend. All in compassion, all in family, so to speak, the very family of God. As that great wedding, as those righteous acts weave together, the hardships you may have gone through and the price you paid weaving that garment together of righteous acts in these flesh bodies, taking forth the word of God, standing against the false one, earning that right, though you may be poor, even in poverty, yet in him you're rich. It doesn't get any better than to inherit Almighty God and all that he has created and all that he owns and to be considered a part of it. That's what's most important is the fact that you can exercise compassion, uh, needs and helpfulness to all whosoever will. Verse 31, to complete the chapter, The priest shall not eat of anything that is dead of itself or torn, whether it be fowl or beast, whether it be poultry or, and or otherwise. Only that that is properly, why, it's unhealthy, that's why. You, you must always properly breed an animal uh, as uh, we are instructed in the books of the law. Why? Because we, these flesh bodies require clean food. If you do not eat clean food, you're going to be sick. And you can't very well serve God if you are ill. Um, that is to say, uh, I don't want, this does not, has nothing to do with handicapped people. Many handicapped people set a far better image before Christ than I could ever uh, do. Because the very fact to the unbeliever to be handicapped and still love the Lord sets an awesome example. And so it is. God has a purpose and a means for everything. So how precious it is serving the living God. Now, we come to chapters that go into the disbursement of land. I'm going to take you there. We're going to go to the fourth verse of chapter 45 
of this great book. And let's pick up on what we're going to be discussing, the holy portion of the land, and that's what we're going to be doing is land allotments, shall be for the priest, the ministers of the sanctuary, which shall come near to minister unto the Lord, and it shall be a place for their houses and an holy place for the sanctuary. In other words, when I point out to you in a moment the sanctuary, this is the place that the Zadok will actually exist. I'm going to skip on to the 8th verse of that 45th chapter, and that 8th verse reads concerning the tribes, in the land shall in the land shall be his possession in Israel. And my princes shall no more oppress my people. They're going to have their own. And the rest of the land shall they give to the house of Israel according to their tribes. And I want to reiterate, according to their tribes. Now, as I've always taught you, a picture speaks a thousand words. So therefore, we're going to go to a picture. And as you notice, so always to the north, Dan is always the furthest north tribe. And we have Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, the largest, Reuben, and then the tribe of Judah. Now here we have the Levitical area, and here you have the area of the sanctuary. This is a one-mile square right here. And, um, and this is for the priests. There's the city, the fields of that. And the prince's domain, these would be about 24 miles across, each of these uh, domains of the prince. And, but this is where it all happens. Right here in this sanctuary is the beautiful place of God. And then below that, where you have Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes that kind of are nearest and that separate, but just south of the city, you have Benjamin, Simeon, and Issachar, Zebulun, Gad, and there you have the 12 tribes in the allotment of land. That is the very picture of how it is laid out, and that speaks a thousand words, whether we could read all these dimensions and all these measurements, but that gets you exactly where we're at and what it's talking about and how precious it is. Our Father, I, I want to simply reiterate one thing. Nobody's going to control anybody's property. Everybody controls their own property. And that goes for even the priest of the Zadok. Nobody's going to control that property other than they themselves, as God has given them that right. But that sanctuary, which I showed you earlier, a picture of it, of how the layout of it is, even down to the outer gates, which has the seven steps, then coming into the inner gates, which you have eight steps, which means up into new beginnings. And that entire uh, picture I showed you of that temple, the sanctuary, is one-seventh larger than the Temple of Solomon, which leads on to the seventh and then the eighth, which again would be new beginnings. And our Father and the Son are the temple thereof in that eternity. What a precious time to live in this age when these things are just before us. They're right at the door because we are in the generation of the fig tree. And uh, all prophecy was to happen in and to that generation. Now, um, chapters uh, 45, the remainder, 46, the allotment, and uh, offerings, and uh, w which is covered by the picture I just showed you. I think it's more meaningful, and that way you're able to understand the layout that God will have in the millennium. That entire width is about 60 to 70 miles by about 50 miles in width, but it's all concentrated right in that place we call Mount Zion. It is there that that sanctuary will be situated, and uh, what a he heavenly thing. Remember Christ's words as he would leave Jerusalem the last time at the first advent. He said, watch these buildings. Not one stone will left, be left standing atop another. It's going to be prepared for that temple 
in that land allotment you just observed so for the people of the living God. And all, whomsoever will, will come there to worship at that time. Now, we're going to skip on to the 47th chapter. And, um, and here we, have, we begin to have teaching again concerning the tribes. But there you have the allotment, how it will be fixed, and nobody will interfere with that. And nobody will try to possess anyone else's land. So, having said that, um, we have the land allotment exactly as the tribes are laid out and the place of worship for whomsoever will through the millennium. The eternal temple will be somewhat different, but be that as it may. Chapter 47, verse 1, the great book of Ezekiel, verse 1 reads, Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. This is the temple itself, sanctuary. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, going to the east gate, okay? And the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar, in other words, it comes right out from under the altar of God. Well, what is this? It's spiritual. But you know what is amazing? If you're a student of God's Word, you know that that stone that uh, was struck, stricken twice by Moses when it was only supposed to be once provided water for all of Israel while they were in the desert. And even King James that arranged this King James Bible, his coronation took place over that stone, the stone of scone. And that stone will still be there, and that spiritual water will still pour forth from it. That's why it's important that you watch and observe history. I know that these words upset certain people. That's okay. Hey, the truth is still truth, and... If you uh, want to doubt, well, just, just doubt, but stick around. You'll find that that's exactly how it will be, exactly. And there that spiritual water pours forth. This is God's way of managing the land allotment we just covered, plus all the children otherwise all over the world, all that ever have been, as they worship the living God because all that remain at that time shall worship him, or they won't be. Next verse, please. Verse 2. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without un, unto the utter gate, the outer gate, by the way that looked eastward. This is the, the gate where the sacrifices were brought in. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. Then, and, uh, and so it is, uh, verse 3. And when the man that had the line in his hand, this is the one doing the measurements and the allotments, he went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubics. And he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. I, 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 could, I could muster that. I could manage it pretty good. And remember the thousand years that we were in, we have a thousand cubics here to go with it. And again, verse 4, again, he measured a thousand. And he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. And again, he measured a thousand. And he brought me through the waters were to the loins. Five. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen and waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. In other words, I could not cross it. As of my tribe and everything else, I could not cross that river, a spiritual river. It's a division, a boundary, a border. <clears throat> and, and so it is. This is our Father's way of, um, uh, of uh, handling things. You might say, well, well, how would the Lord handle that? He walked on the water. No problem whatsoever. But man could not do that. And so it is. God has a way. And he sets the boundaries thereof. 
Even the boundaries we just observed in the land allotment of Israel, those boundaries are set. Verse 6, And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Look at it. Look at that water. Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. He took me right back to the lip of it. 7, Now I had returned, behold, at the bank, or the lip of the river, were very many trees on the one side and the other. There were trees for food on both sides. But he, he couldn't cross it. But others could. They were there. Again, this is spiritual. It's not actual H2O we're talking about here. Know and understand and learn. We're in the millennium. You've got to come with me. It is God's way, and, and God's way is, believe it or not, the way it's going to be. Verse 8, Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert. Do you know what's in the east country there? In the Mount of Olives. And go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And, and uh, so they are healed. And uh, salt for healing. How precious it is that our Father leads, guides, and directs, but also he shares all this information with us, that we have that truth and that knowledge to understand, even how it will be not only in this earth age, but the millennium which is knocking on the door when we see God's way of recovering and giving an opportunity to all in spiritual bodies that might not have been able to even learn in the flesh. But in that spiritual body have no um, infringements that would prevent them from having 100% recall to learn and to know and to understand you're going to love the Father or you're going to love Satan's ways. It's up to you. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra.